Good morning, all, and welcome to this ICANN 78 readout webinar um, brought to you by ADA on the 16th of November 2023. Uh, my name is Jordan Carter, and I'm ADA's Internet Governance and Policy Director. Delighted to be joined by an interesting panel who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, I'd like to start, though, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which I'm, from which I'm coming to you today, the original home of the Wurundjeri people um, and the Burnong people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, I also acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples were the first people to innovate and use technology on this land and to do so over many millennia, uh, knowledge upon which we continue to build today. Um, uh, this is a readout webinar from the ICAM meeting recently held in, let's see if I can get to the next slide, Sunny Hamburg. Um, for those of you who had the luck to be there, you'll know that Hamburg was mostly not sunny, uh, but it was a, a good ICANN meeting. Um, and I'm delighted to uh, be joined today by four excellent speakers to give us perspectives from different parts of the ICANN community. Um, we're gonna take those speakers in the order that are here on this slide. So first, Cheryl Langdon Orr will bring us tales from the at-large community. Um, Ian Sheldon will um, enliven us with the GACS proceedings. Um, Annalise will get into the detail of the CCNSO's work at this meeting. And Julie Hammer will bring us some perspectives from the SSAC perspective. Um, they'll, they'll sort of be between five and eight minutes um, per person. Um, just by way of housekeeping, um, there's a Q&A pod. If you've got questions or even potentially comments you'd like to offer, please do feel welcome to use that uh, system to lodge them. And if they're a sort of facty type question, we might type in a reply, but otherwise um, we'll take those at the end of the, the readout. And um, so we'll just get the presentations on the table first. Depending on the amount of uh, discussion, um, we might have a little bit of a chance to mention a few um, reflections from the Internet Governance Forum 2023, which was held just before um, the ICANN meeting in Kyoto, Japan. Um, but we'll see how we go time-wise. Um, and as booked, we'll definitely be wrapping up before 12 o'clock. We got a 90 minute slot for this webinar. Um, so we're not gonna have slides for this. We'll be focusing and pinning the people who are speaking with us um, to give them the chance. And uh, as you're a happy MC today, if I feel like they're drifting a little bit past their allocated time, I'll, I'll gently button and ask them to to move right along. Um, no shepherd's crook, just a gentle voice to do that if required. Um, so with that, I think I'll stop the sharing and uh, welcome our first um, speaker who is Cheryl Langdon Orr. Cheryl, over to you. Thank you very much, Jordan. An absolute pleasure to be here today with uh, the rest of this group of uh, uh, distance travellers. We, we've put a few kilometres on the clock this year with these ICANN meetings, uh, including to anything but sunny um, Hamburg. Uh, and it was a long meeting. It was a big meeting. It was the annual general meeting. Um, it's always amusing when uh, most of us, including ALAC and the various uh, at large community leaders um, start two, if not three, or sometimes four days in advance of these uh, uh, three, four, five day meetings. So uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we're away for 10 days worth of meetings and uh, technically it looks like it's only five days worth of work. Well, I can assure you um, a lot is packed into these uh, gatherings. Uh, Alec uh, and uh, the at-large community leaders that were in attendance, and I'd like you to note that it's not just our meetings, um, but like most of the meetings that are held these days um, in the world of ICANN, um, I think we're almost getting to all of the meetings these days, uh, are very much uh, open to public. Uh, and so we welcome uh, a number of anybody and everybody uh, attending to come and join us. Over the weekend, though, over the Saturday and Sunday, um, we conducted those sets of meetings which are uh, more regularised at year end, those large reporting activities, um, looking at uh, what some of our main pillars within at-large and, and ALAC's uh, particular subcommittees 
Um, we have a subcommittee, for example, on outreach and engagement, and we have two particularly important um, prime working groups, one called the Capacity uh, sorry, let me say that again, um, the Consolidated Policy Working Group uh, and the other, the Operation, Finance and, and Budget Working Group. And their job is to meet regularly in the case of the, um, the Consolidated Policy one, it meets weekly. Uh, and so there's an enormous amount of what we've done over the year to report on. So all those sorts of businessy type meetings uh, were conducted on the Saturday and Sunday with those updates. But we did manage to also squeeze in a couple of very important and always very rewarding bilateral meetings, um, both with the GNSO, which surprisingly enough, uh, was an awful lot about new names and next rounds and applicant support and such. Um, and of course, the ESSAC and our meetings with the ESSAC, as I suspect Julie might allude to as well, um, have just been so valuable. Um, we find not only do we share so much in common in terms of concerns, but we also leverage enormous amounts of learnings off each other um, with the technical interests and expertise uh, coming out of the um, the ESSAC uh, and the ALAC and at large's particular focus on the effects on internet end users. Um, it really is one of the highlights of our regular bilaterals uh, and this year's one uh, at uh, the Hamburg meeting was certainly uh, no different to the others. Another really good bilateral, but not held during the weekend, um, but midweek is our also rewarding bilateral with the Government Advisory Committee. Um, and so all of us ACs, all of us advisory committees, um, do gather uh, and we gather to share, find out where we have uh, overlapping interests, concerns, uh, perhaps sometimes confusions, um, questions to raise, um, issues to pursue, uh, and occasionally, um, and when we do do this, um, perhaps some joint work um, that might be undertaken in the coming months. And in the case of the Government Advisory Committee and the At-Large Advisory Committee, I can assure you there's some uh, mutual work uh, in the uh, in the sides that are going to be uh, coming out over the uh, coming months um, because we definitely have some uh, statements we probably think we should be making. More on that later. Um, we also held the now regular um, uh, space meetings, uh, the AFRI ICANN space, uh, the meeting uh, that is dedicated to uh, not just the at large community, but all aspects of ICANN interests that hail out of Africa um, was held. And that is a meeting that is held at each ICANN meeting. And the now more regular, and we will be continuing this now as a whenever we gather together in an ICANN meeting, the Asia Pacific. Um, APAC space is also now a regularised meeting. And again, these are opportunities not just for a large community, but any of the ICANN community from that specific region to gather and again find uh, points of mutual interest, um, sometimes um, a discussion and debate, um, but always healthy and rewarding discourse. We also had a uh, internal training um, and conducted for incoming leaders, uh, be they for the regional um, areas or, of course, the um, at-large advisory committee itself um, because of this year-end aspect of this particular meeting uh, with a changeover of roles and positions. But we held for everybody to join us, and they were well attended, three plenaries. Um, the first one was on the impact of technological advancement uh, in ICANN, and we had um, uh, John and a few of the um, uh, technical crew um, sharing the types of things they both use within ICANN, including AI, um, to help do what ICANN needs to do, and also the sorts of things that they are looking at um, in terms of threat analysis and opportunities as well. So that was well and truly worthwhile. And do remember, all of these plenaries are recorded and so if someone wants to go to the uh, meetings web space and look at the meeting 
that was held, you can actually review um, the archive. The next one, which uh, I found quite interesting, was actually a part two. There was a, a pre meeting meeting on SpaceX and Iris 2 and what's happening in low Earth orbiting satellites um, and how it may or may not um, have a, a effect on equitable internet access. Um, we held a, a part two um, as, as an open policy session under the European, the Uralo auspices, um, and it was looking at what the multi-stakeholder governance model uh, might offer as we look forward to these technologies. And lastly, um, we held a plenary on WISIS Plus 20, uh, looking towards an engagement strategy that the at-large community might wish to take. In the closing few uh, seconds of what I've got left in my time, I also wanted to mention that we turned 20. Yay. Happy anniversary to us. Uh, there was many anniversaries going on, and I'm sure everyone will talk about their own. Um, but we had spent now 20 years in its current form of the final ALAC. That's a 15-person advisory committee that is formed out of the five geographic regions um, and includes nominating committee members. So uh, there was a huge cake. And give me a couple more seconds. There was a storybook. Can you see the storybook? Oh, let me see if I can get that. Uh, here we are. Right. ALAC. The little engine that could. Um, there's a, a, a lot of fun um, being held on that. With that, forgive me for the 30 seconds too long. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. That was uh, very well timed. And um, it's a shame with these backgrounds that it always makes holding something up to the screen a little tricky. But uh, the the book uh, is worth a little read, a little bit of, bit of poetry to lighten up your eye can day. Um, I was editorialized for a moment as we go. The, the, I think there are three things that you've mentioned that will come up with everyone. There's the anniversaries, the plethora of anniversaries that this meeting marked. Um, WISIS plus 20 is going to come up um, a bit. And I think applicant support in the nature of the, um, the new uh, next GTLD round is probably worth mentions as well. Uh, and I will mention at this point that we haven't um, managed to grab a GNSO rep for this uh, webinar. So there'll be obviously the GNSO's uh, work is a large part of what happens in the ICANN environment. So I'm sorry that we don't have that participation in today's panel, but I think some of the topics that were raised there will be similar to the ones that we've mentioned. Um, the one that hasn't been mentioned so far is DNS abuse, but I'm sure that will come up with other people as well. So thank you, Cheryl. Um, let me turn to our second panelist, who is Ian Sheldon from the Australian government. Uh, Ian, welcome along and over to you. And you've got around uh, eight minutes too. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, my name is Ian Sheldon. I'm the Director of Internet Governance at the Department of Infrastructure. And I'm also the Australian uh, GAC representative to ICANN. Um, ICANN 78, I think, was quite a good meeting for, for the GAC. Um, you know, of course, the GAC communique covers a large majority of the discussion uh, from the GAC across the week, but I thought it useful to provide a couple of reflections from my perspective and bring a little light and colour to, uh, to what can be at times quite a dry document. Um, so I thought a couple of issues for the GAC that I thought worth drawing your attention to. Um, beginning with the GAC capacity building weekend. Um, so as many of you know, the GAC has had quite a lot of turnover over the last couple of years. Um, and so we continue to tinker with our approach to how we build capacity in the margins of each ICANN meeting um, and bring a lot of our new GAC members on, on board um, and get them up to speed on a lot of the topics of, of key interest. Um, at the Hamburg meeting, we held our usual uh, ICANN 101 session on Saturday, uh, going through how ICANN operates uh, and uh, highlighting some of the key issues of interest to the GAC uh, before having a tech focus day uh, on the Sunday. So Sunday's focus uh, was predominantly on blockchain and its impact on the DNS. Uh, a large majority of the GAC uh, weren't aware of blockchain uh, domains. Uh, so much of the day was geared towards simply explaining how blockchain technology works and providing, providing some basic examples of how the technology intersects with the DNS. Um, I think the big question 
um, coming out of that session was whether well, blockchain-based domains should continue to exist outside of ICANN policy space, or whether ICANN should be, begin preparing to find some way to integrate them into the into the existing model. Um, you know, ICANN, uh, the GAX certainly doesn't have any clear views, uh, given this was uh, the very start of this conversation, looking to build a lot of capacity with um, a lot of the GAC collective, but it's an issue that I think many governments are beginning to grapple with. And so it's good to have a reasonably informal discussion about these emerging topics um, without some of the formality that comes with uh, some of the GAC proper sessions that, that we that we go through during the, during the week proper. Um, there was also the start of the discussion around the next high level government meeting or HLGM, which is scheduled for just before the ICANN 80 meeting in uh, Kigali. Um, so this will be the first uh, GAC uh, high-level government meeting since Barcelona in 2018. Um, and I think it's going to be a particularly timely event as it will give governments and ministers an opportunity to really discuss important internet governance issues in the middle of what will be a very busy year for governments uh, next year um, amongst uh, broader discussions like the Global Digital Compact uh, likely being negotiated early in 2024 and the, and the WISIS plus 20 negotiations are coming shortly after. Um, so we actually hope to land uh, some of that agenda discussion at a call later tonight. Um, and really it's, it's uh, the Australian government's goal to keep the high level government meeting agenda focused on uh, kind of three, three main uh, we've, got, we've got three main priorities in this space. Uh, you know, one reaffirming the important role that ICANN and the multi-stakeholder community plays on intergovernance matters, um, trying to keep the agenda um, out of some of the weeds on ICANN policy. Um, you know, we are painfully aware that uh, a lot of our ministers um, attached to the countries who participate in the GAC may not be across a lot of the GAC. Um, policy development processes. So we're trying to keep this reasonably high level and, and engaging for, for senior representatives from government. Um, and importantly, uh, number three, uh, trying to keep away from some of those topics that, um, that probably shouldn't exist um, solely within, within ICANN, um, where there are some other places within the internet landscape that might be better better place to pick them, pick them up, um, uh, like cybercrime, uh, for instance. Um, so, uh, a lot of the discussion was about how do we, how do we prepare ourselves for this big high level meeting next, next year. Um, the rest of the week proceeded reasonably smoothly. I think, um, there was a lot of robust discussion on uh, a lot of the key topics that you would have heard, um, already before the next round of GTLDs, uh, applicant support, um, the registration data request system or, I think maybe there's another acronym which it, which, it, uh, which is used now, uh, data accuracy and, and DNS abuse. Um, importantly, the GAC also issued advice on the topic of closed generics to advise the board, the ICANN board, to make clear in the applicant guidebook that applications for closed generic top level domains were not to be considered um, in the next round of new GTLDs. Uh, so this is an issue that's uh, quite Quite, quite a sensitive one sometimes. So it was, it was quite pleasing to see the GAC issue some consensus advice on this on this piece, and it remains to be seen uh, how the board uh, engages with uh, with that um, with that piece of wording. Um, the GAC also held our annual uh, leadership election with uh, the vice chairs up for election this time around. So this election saw eight nominations for five positions. Uh, UK, China, Egypt, Lebanon, Colombia, Chad, Niue, and Chinese Taipei. And the five successful candidates were from the UK, China, Egypt, Lebanon, and Colombia, uh, all of whom will start their term at the next ICANN meeting in San Juan. And uh, finally, I also wanted to briefly mention that uh, uh, Australia chairs two informal uh, GAC groupings, the Commonwealth uh, GAC group and the Asia Pacific uh, GAC group. And we held both of these meetings in the margins of some of the formal discussions uh, at, at ICANN uh, 78 in Hamburg. Uh, so the APAC GAC 
discussion focused uh, predominantly on barriers to participation uh, from GAC representatives in our region. Uh, so touching on a lot of issues like time zone challenges, uh, cost of travel to a lot of these meetings, uh, some language barriers and the impost of uh, resourcing um, being uh, common factors across pretty much everybody from our, from our region. The Commonwealth GAC discussion focused uh, primarily on development opportunities for African countries, um, including a guest presentation from ICANN staff on the Coalition for Digital Africa initiative, as well as a presentation uh, from Rwanda ahead of the um, high level government meeting uh, scheduled for next year. Um, both of these are, are different configurations for the GAC to assemble in smaller, kind of more intimate, more informal groups. And we had good attendance at, uh, at both of these meetings, uh, uh, particularly the Asia Pacific grouping. Um, it's fantastic to see a lot more um, of, uh, of our neighbor uh, countries participating in the GAC and becoming a little bit more vocal on, on some of these important matters. Um, so uh, looking forward to, to San Juan, um, I expect the GAC will continue focusing on, on a lot of the usual uh, topics that we've been discussing for the last couple of years, uh, but I also sp suspect a lot of the discussion will turn to uh, implications from the Global Digital Compact um, and how do we start navigating some of those big, meaty digital issues as they relate to, to what happens at, at ICANN. Um, that's it from me. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, um, Ian. <clears throat> Appreciate that readout. Um, the sort of blockchain and DNS uh, issue came up a bit um, in, in a Q&A question with a Polly wondering if there's any documentation on that discussion that's available. Is, are there any sort of slide packs or anything available from the GAC convos that we could sort of direct people to? Um, I will find out. Um, I, I'm certain there are slide packs we can we can share. Um, the uh, Octo uh, gave quite a good presentation on on blockchain DNS and and if they're available to the GAC, then I'm sure we can make them available to the Australian community. Okay, so um, that would be handy. Holly, maybe ping in about that uh, and or do some digging around on the ICANN website. Um, thank you, Ian. Uh, the next speaker that we'll turn to is Annalise Williams, um, my colleague here at Ada, to give us a readout on the CCNSO's uh, proceedings. Thanks, Jordan. Um, as you and Cheryl mentioned earlier, um, it, it is anniversary season at ICANN. It was, um, it's ICANN's 25th anniversary this year, but it's the 20th anniversary of the CCNSO. Um, and in earlier meetings this year, uh, representatives from the CCETLD community have, have reflected on the evolution of the CCNSO and key milestones in its history. But for this meeting, um, the CCNSO's anniversary committee organised a, a special event, uh, a World Cafe meeting for CCTLD members to uh, explore what makes the CCNSO relevant to the, to the rest of the community for the next five to ten years. Uh, that was a closed session. It was only open to those who were participating in person, but the there will be a follow-up meeting scheduled um, and held virtually prior to ICANN 79. Um, DNS abuse is always uh, a high priority issue in the CCNSO. The um, CCNSO has a, a domain abuse standing committee known as the DASC. Uh, that's a dedicated forum for CC managers to assist in their efforts to, to mitigate abuse. Um, but in keeping with the, the nature of the CCNSO, the DASC doesn't formulate policy. Um, its, its purpose is just to increase awareness and understanding of the issues relating to DNS abuse and promote um, dialogue and share information and insights among managers. Um, so during the uh, Hamburg meeting, the DASC held a session with the GAC to update governments on its work, uh, and it met with the leadership of uh, the GNSO's registry stakeholder group to explore the differences and similarities between CCTLDs and GTLDs. And they also held a, an information session informing the community about different tools that can be used to mitigate abuse, and, as well as different ways of measuring it. And they highlighted uh, uh, an online repository of tools and resources that's been developed um, relating to DNS abuse and also announced the launch of a, a new dedicated email list just as an additional resource for CCTLD managers. 
Um, for next steps for the for the desk, they'll be focusing on four questions. Um, those questions are: Do data validation and registration policies for CCTLDs relate to to DNS abuse, and if so, how? How can CCTLDs effectively work with registrars to mitigate DNS abuse? What are the tools and measurements of CT CCTLDs can use to mitigate DNS abuse? Um, do CCTLD governance models and regulatory frameworks impact the DNS abuse? Um, so another uh, high, high interest topic for the CCNSO was, oh, and for much of the rest of the community as well, was the WISIS Plus 20. Um, so the WISIS Plus 20 is a UN process that will be taking place in 2025, and it will be informed by other UN processes taking place in 2024, um, including the Global Digital Compact, which will be negotiated at the Summit of the Future. And we've written blogs um, about both of those things. I'm not sure whether Mike or someone can perhaps drop those in the chat. Um, so the CCNSO Council raised these issues in its in their meeting with the ICANN board, and the ICANN board confirmed that it's a it's a high priority issue for them, and referenced um, the CEO's 2024 goals, which include developing uh, and implementing a, a communications and engagement strategy for um, for the WISIS Plus 20. And um, it was also discussed in the meeting between the, the CCNS, CCNSO Council and the GNSO Council. Many uh, in the GNSO um, engage primarily at ICANN and aren't really following these intergovernmental processes. So it's a good opportunity to you know, raise awareness amongst um, other stakeholders in the community as well. And it was also raised by a couple of participants in a meeting that was held of stakeholders involved in the technical coordination of the internet's unique identifiers. So it's um, encouraging to see the beginnings of coordination on these issues um, amongst the technical stakeholders as well. And the CCNSO's Internet Governance Liaison Committee also organised a session on WISIS Plus 20 just to explore what's happening and why it's important to CCTLD managers. Uh, we were joined by three external expert speakers um, and then the managers of .de and .jp, so it's the, the CCTLDs for Germany and Japan, shared their respective uh, approaches and perspectives so this, the Internet Governance Liaison Committee was established by the CCNSO to increase awareness and participation um, among CCTLD managers in internet governance discussions and, and processes more broadly. And in addition to the WISA session, uh, the IGLC held a, a working session over the on the Saturday where CCTLD managers and um, ICANN's government engagement team undertook a mapping exercise just to consider the or identify the hot issues um, in internet governance across the various uh, regions. And that input will be processed and used to sort of help form a picture of how internet issues are developing over time and it'll inform the future work plan of the um, Internet Governance Liaison Committee. Um, and uh, Jordan and I both had an opportunity to uh, present on Outer's Internet Governance Roadmap, which we uh, published in, in August uh, to the CCNSO and um, just tell, this, tell people about it and answer questions from interested members. Uh, and there were a few other policy matters that came up in the CCNSO. Uh, the, the council uh, mandated a small team of uh, councillors and community members who will be preparing sessions at ICANN 79 on consolidating the CCNSO's existing policies. Uh, its policies are, are in various places at the moment um, and just sort of identifying gaps in the current policies and practices and considering how to address future undefined issues in the CCTLD post-delegation process. Jordan, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything else on the, the policy aspect. Uh, just really briefly, Annalise, that um, the CCNSO is the authority for making the policy framework that defines how IANA interacts with CCTLDs. Um, and it's that policy framework that Annalise is referring to. Um, and there was a case that came up where in, in Lebanon, there's been some public correspondence about this, where the named CCTLD manager um, 
who wished to no longer be named because they weren't doing that job and there was no replacement manager. So the question was, how does the policy framework deal with that? The answer is that it doesn't. So IATA created a caretaker operations status uh, to be listed in the root zone as the CCTLD manager. That did not mean IANA was operating um, .lb. That was still being done in country. But that raised the question of, well, we should maybe have something in the policy to deal with that. Um, and maybe we should check as to whether there are other gaps that need filling in that global policy framework. So there'll be a number of sessions um, digging into these questions and getting community feedback um, at the next meeting in San Juan in March 2024. So that's all I'd add to that. Is it, are you done with your um, TC and That's it for me. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah. Thanks, um, Annalise. So just add two other quick points. Um, for the more technically minded among the audience, the CCNSO does operate a tech day, which happens on the Monday of the ICANN meeting. Um, uh, you can find details about that on the, um, the wiki um, space. And uh, that would, um, uh, you know, they always have a number of interesting presentations. That's another resource that the CCNSO provides that gets quite a lot of cross-community engagement and interest as well. Um, and for those wondering about any leadership announcements, the CCNSO, for reasons that are lost in the mists of time, um, elects its leadership group uh, in March, not in October. So that's coming up at the next meeting as well. Um, let me move on to our fourth uh, speaker, um, who is Julie Hammer from uh, the SSAC community. Uh, Julie, over to you. Thanks, Jordan. And um, for those who aren't familiar with our acronyms, the SAC is the Security and Stability Advisory Committee. And um, we had uh, quite a revolutionary for us um, change this meeting. Uh, we decided that um, our practice of always having all of our meetings closed except for the SAC public meeting and the meeting with the board, um, that that practice would change. We, the reason that our meetings have been closed was because we felt that some of the information shared could be proprietal or confidential. But when we reflected on how often that actually happens in our discussions, we realised that it was really quite rare. And uh, should that situation arise, then we could certainly move into a closed mode. So um, we made the decision not too long before ICANN 78 that we were going to have um, the majority of our sessions open, and they were, but um, that knowledge wasn't widely um, understood prior to ICANN 78. So, But we did have a number of people join our meetings, and that was... Um, very welcome and uh, our plan is before ICANN 79 that we will make that new practice of ours um, much more visible so that uh, others are welcome to join um, our meetings that have traditionally been closed. Um, we did have quite a lot of um, work uh, sessions that were focused on progressing work that's currently underway. Uh, one of the major projects that the ESSEC has been working on for a very long time is the Name Collision Analysis Project, and that work is being done in a group that is actually broader than just the ESSEC. It has members from other parts of the community participating, and it's responding to the board's request for specific advice regarding the next round of new GTLDs and its advice on um, the status of delegation of .home.court.mail, uh, whether those um, uh, strings ought to be delegated or not, and then more general advice on um, other strings that could uh, lead to name collisions in um, if, if they were delegated. So that work has been going for a very long time. Um, it's not a large group, but it, it does um, bring together a number of people with quite different perspectives. And therefore, there's been a great deal of debate and um, very collaborative 
um, discussions on that topic. And it is at the stage where it's finalising a proposal for applications to undergo a staged assessment workflow by an independent technical review team to assess the visibility of name collisions. And this is a proposal that will be going, um, hoping to go to public comment before the end of the year and uh, following the review of that public comment and any uh, resultant update of the proposal um, that will go to the board to answer the specific questions that they have posed to the ESAC. Um, huge body of work. It, it really has been going for about six years now and um, it will be very good to see that come to fruition. Uh, we also had some very um, fruitful sessions progressing the three major work parties that the ESAC members are um, working on at the moment. Uh, one is the Registrar Name Management Work Party, which is um, exploring long-standing risks that emerge from the expiration of domains that other domains rely on for authoritative name service. And um, in, in that regard, uh, registrar practices have unintentionally exposed over half a million domains to resolution hijacking risk. So what this report is aiming to do is um, highlight this issue, explain it, and discuss the potential options for operational changes that would avoid creating these DNS resolution hijacking risks. So that one we're hoping, um, that work party is hoping to deliver um, probably with a number of recommendations. Um, I suspect that will be sometime in the new year. Uh, the DS automation, that is uh, delegation sign-up automation work party uh, is aiming to develop recommendations for automating the management of delegation sign-up records during periodic changes of um, DNS set keys. Uh, that is a topic that has a great deal of um, opposing views and um, variations even on similar views. So there's been a huge amount of debate and to and froing on that topic, um, whether it will end up having uh, recommendations or whether it will uh, simply expose um, issues and present a number of options for the way forward to be considered by the community remains to be seen, depends on the degree of consensus that we can achieve within the ESAC. And the third work party is called the Evolution of DNS Resolution. And that work party has been uh, looking at technologies that are changing the nature of DNS resolution and the implications of these changes on the DNS namespace, provisioners and operators of DNS infrastructure. Uh, it is the case that alternative naming systems have the potential to create situations where the same name exists in more than one system. And that potentially can lead to name collisions where the same name can resolve in different ways. So again, um, it's not yet clear whether that work party will have any firm recommendations or whether it will simply be an exposure of the issue and a discussion of um, the, the problems uh, and potential ways in which those problems might be mitigated without any firm recommendations to either the board or the community. Uh, so that, they're all near in completion. And um, I know that the aim will be to have all three of those uh, products delivered before ICANN 79. Uh, whether that happens or not remains to be seen. Um, so the ESAC uh, did not celebrate 20, a 20-year 20 anniversary at ICANN 78 because we had our 20-year anniversary two years ago. Um, and however, the ESAC does have um, a leadership tra transition coming up 
Um, Rod Rasmussen has been the SAC chair for the last six years, and I've been the vice chair for the last six years. And we hand over to a new team on the 31st of December this year with they're picking up the reins in the new year. And that will be um, to Ram Mohan, uh, who was a, a long-standing board member as the ESAC liaison to the ICANN board. Uh, he, I think Ram served nine years on the board, so he comes with um, a great deal of experience and um, corporate knowledge. And... Uh, Tara Whalen will be the vice chair. So um, we're looking forward to uh, handing over the reins with great confidence in uh, the new team. And um, that concludes my report. Thanks. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, thank you very much, um, Julie. That's some absolutely fascinating um, studies that you were mentioning there that the ASAC is working on. And I think there's an interesting link between that evolution of DNS resolution, one, the third one that you mentioned, and the um, discussion of the capacity building of the GAC that Ian mentioned. Um, I think there is a, a looming question for ICANN as a whole to get to grips with about this, um, these alternative namespaces and whether in the interests of avoiding consumer confusion problems and unpredictable arrival at internet resources, um, ICANN's going to need to look at expanding its scope to deal with some other um, namespaces, namespaces in quotes beyond the DNS, and uh, how that will how, how the people in these namespaces will react to that idea. Because for some of them, it's probably a good idea, and for some of them, it's probably the last thing they want because they like the unregulated, uh, wild west uh, nature of things. Um, but thank you again. Um, look, we've got a, a bit of time for um, Q&A before possibly um, making a few comments about the IGF, as I foreshadowed at the start of this call. There are a couple of um, Q&A questions already there. Um, Holly asks about whether the DNS Abuse Institute was part of the discussion. I think that was directed for you, Annalise, in terms of the CCNSO discussions on DNS abuse. Um, do you want to answer that? Thanks, Jordan. Um, so Bruce Tonkin is out as representative in the DNS Abuse Standing Committee. Um, I will get back to you, Holly, on whether the that report was part of the discussion at this meeting. Um, and I see that you have uh, another question in the chat about um, when I, I mentioned the meeting amongst the operators of the, the technical identifiers. Yes, uh, it, it's names and and addresses there. Sorry for the confusion. That that meeting was an interesting one to look back at the transcript of. Um, if you are interested, um, that was at four pm on the Wednesday of the ICANN meeting, and it did include regional internet registries. Um, standards bodies and so on. So it was a, an interesting dialogue um, convened by ICANN, um, uh, Tripti Sinha and, um, and Christian Kaufman from the ICANN board. Um, look, there are not other questions at the moment. So you've got a, a little bit of uh, um, a moment to add any questions or reflections, participants. Um, I'll just sort of rattle few, through a few of the, the themes that have come up with a common mentions, but just before I do that, I'll mention one other um, thing that I know has been on the mind of the community, which is that um, ICANN and the, the registrars have negotiated a, a set of changes to the registrar agreement that um, obliges them to be doing um, some modest steps in the direction of dealing with uh, DNS abuse. Um, and this is, was the product of a bilateral negotiation and informed by the sort of rising discussions and debates about DNS abuse within the ICANN community and in institutions alongside it, like the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network over the last few years. By the last few years, I think it's probably been five or seven or 10 years. Um, and those contract amendments are out uh, to uh, for voting and um, one of the ways changes those agreements get made is by the 
people are subject to them voting to agree the changes. So there's a turnout requirement, I understand, uh, and a, a level of support requirement. So if any of you are connected with such registrars, um, you might want to advocate to them to uh, vote in favor of those. I think the vote is still going on. Um, Cheryl, it sounds like you might know more about that than I do. I, I, I believe, unless my 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 ears are faulty um that the uh, benchmarks even though the vote is still on have in fact been met so it looks very positive um it's a, a very very high it's got to be uh, you know 80 90 percent of all possible uh, voters uh, turnout and then there's a super majority requirement it is a extremely high benchmark but it looks like those base parameters have been met so we should be in reasonably positive uh, um, outcomes when the uh, the final numbers are counted. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, and Holly, Holly asks, what are the changes in the agreements? Um, honestly, I, I don't know the details, um, Holly, but I know that if you um, if you do a little bit of Googling around the ICANN um, website, you'll definitely land on them quite quickly. Um, my understanding is that it is very much focused on the, the technical definitions of DNS abuse. So it's it's the phishing um, botnet style stuff. It's not the broader questions of content abuse that sometimes float up in our um, world. Um, uh, so I, I won't try and say any more, otherwise I'll just start making things up for you. So I won't do that. Um, uh, uh, we've got a sort of comment from Doc. Uh, Sheldon or a question, the blockchain DNS issue is particularly concerning. Is it the panel's opinion that there is a prevalent interest across all players to reach a consensus on a resolution of that? Um, would any of you like to tackle that uh, question? Just, just start talking if you do. You're all on mute, so uh, that I think indicates not. I would argue, Doc, uh, from my point of view, that no, there is not a consensus about that. I expect that within the ICANN environment, um, people are very focused often on maintaining the narrow scope of ICANN's activity for all sorts of uh, reasons. And uh, I would expect that any proposal to broaden ICANN's scope to en envelop these other naming systems would be highly controversial and the last thing that you'd start with was a consensus but of course you'd never arrive at a consensus without starting the conversation so i think that's possibly something that we're edging towards starting there's a few reckons for you does that provoke any other responses from the the panelists on this question Doesn't look like it. Keep keep mulling teams, see if you get anything else comes to mind. Um, we've got another question that's come up. Um, was there any were there any discussions of territorial CCTLDs like .tk and .cc and their continued role as a haven for bad actors? Um, I don't know if anyone would like to talk about that. Um, Annalise or Ian, perhaps, is the first instance. Is there was there any discussion about that at this meeting that you were aware of, Annalise? So I'll, I'll jump in first from the the CCNSO perspective. Um, there was no, it, it didn't appear on any of the agenda items of the meetings that I was in. Um, it's yeah, it wasn't a, a topic of discussion for the CCNSO as a whole. Um, Jordan, um, Ian, I'm not sure whether the, the GAC had anything to say. Thanks, Annalise. Jordan, um, no, it, it, it didn't come up as a formal topic of discussion for the for the GAC, um, but I should mention, um, at least on dot, dot .cc, um, that there has been a, a lot of work undertaken recently over the last over the last year or so in in working with the local community, um, our Australian Federal Police um, and the technical managers of .cc to improve its management arrangements um, and um, uh, help address some of those historical concerns that may have been in place around the, the management of, of the external uh, country code top level domain. Um, but beyond uh, beyond that, in a more broad sense, um, the, the topic wasn't broached. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Ian and Annalise, for that. Um, it's a it's a sort of um, strong feature of the CCNSO's way of working that um, we tend not to, as a as a council or as an organisation, um, shine a light on the activities are within a particular CCTLD because generally those things are dealt with on the national level. And certainly for me as a member of the CCNSO Council, um, I have no view and would express no view on the internal workings of any particular um, CCTLD. Um, so we're a platform for CCTLDs to come together and not a star chamber to judge how they're going. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that, for, which is why I'm not gonna offer an opinion in response to that question. Um, Holly, we're only doing uh, written questions um, here. We're not going to take any video or audio. Um, so if you've got a question, please feel free to pop it into the, the question pod. Um, uh, there's one other um, sort of facet on this that I did want to mention because it has been a season of anniversaries. Um, this one was... Uh, the 20th anniversary of the CCNSO and the uh, GNSO and the ALAC, I believe. Um, it was the 25th anniversary of ICANN's actual foundation as an organization, which happened um, at the end of October in, uh, or the end of September, I can't remember which month, like I wasn't around, in 1998, so that's 25 years. And it also marked um, seven years since the IANA stewardship um, transition, um, which was the moment where um, the last residual contractual links between the United States government and ICANN came to an end. Um, uh, an enormously intense uh, period of cross-community work um, that led to a new set of bylaws for ICANN with a new set of accountability provisions that was the quid pro, quid pro quo for releasing ICANN from those remaining contractual links. Um, uh, an enormously fascinating process to be in, and I think if you want background on that, it would be um, something to uh, talk about with veterans who were there um, at uh, various points. Um, look, I'm just going to deal with, with another um, a comment and a question. Jack Kerr says it's an international issue, not one about a particular jurisdiction. And I think that's right, Jack, are talking about CCTK, um, bad actors, and so on. Um, and the challenge for the CCNSO in dealing with them is relates to the, the way I characterize the issue for us, because we are very careful not to commentate about particular CCs. It's difficult to have conversations about particular CCs in any, in any fashion in the ICANN environment. Um, and that is a kind of um, limitation of the current approach to these issues taken within the ICANN system. Um, it's a deliberate limitation. And so how fit for purpose that is, I guess, is something that could be discussed, but it isn't an accident. Um, uh, Holly's got a question about how do we support at least a discussion on broadening the ICANN scope as suggested by Ian? Um, I don't know if any panelists have got a, a view on that. I could offer a very initial view, which would be to raise that within your particular SO and AC and see what opinion is um, about it, whether ICANN scope needs to be increased. Um, I don't know whether um, anyone else has a view that they'd like to share about that. Feel free to if you do. And if not, that's okay too. And I'll just take um, one last question that's come in from Jack. Was there any discussion about the role of registration masking companies um, and their role in enabling the spread of disinformation by keeping the identity of websites owners anonymous? That's a great question, um, Jack. Uh, panelists, does anyone have uh, a comment on that? Um, it might be something we should ask at, at our side, Jack, and we could ask Bruce Tonkin, um, as Annalise mentioned, who's on the Domain Name Abuse Standing Committee at CCNSO. So it could have been part of the discussion um, with the registrar stakeholder group, but 
think I'm right in saying that none of us were actually in the room for that conversation. So if you want to drop one of us an email, uh, jordan.carter at auda.org.au or annalise.williams, the same, we can follow that up with an ADA um, and come back to you. Um, so that's that one. And this, we've got one last question before we turn very briefly to a couple of uh, quick IGF reflections. Um, just from academic interest, any comment on the future of Australian territories who have their own Alpha 2 code uh, and therefore have their own CCTLD as well? CX, Christmas Islands, CC, Cocos, Keeling Islands, NF, Norfolk Island, and HM, the Herd, and McDonald Islands. Uh, the future of these territories. Um, who would like to speak about that, Ian? Is that something that you've got a view on, or is it something you don't have a view on? <laughs> um I mean, you know, I, I guess I guess formally each of those uh, CCTLDs uh, are managed in a slightly different way, as you alluded to, um, Jordan. Um, um, I'm, uh, I mean, look, I, I'd be happy to unpack the question a little, a little more at a later date, um, as far as what the future may entail. Um, uh, but uh, but at this at this point in time, um, the question really is. Um, you know, how do you ensure the local community um, and the CCTLD continues to work for the needs of the of the local community? Um, you know, for us formally, the multi-stakeholder model is an important one, and and the CCTLD needs to continue to work to address the needs um, of of those it's been it's been assigned to. Um, uh, so for now, um, I, I know that. Um, uh, they share thinking and resources and, and continue to, to work together to address uh, broad challenges that they all, may all face. Uh, but, but beyond that, as far as more substantively on the future of these CCTLDs, I, I don't have any more to, more to provide at this stage, unfortunately. Uh, thanks, um, Ian. Cheryl, you've got a view on this one as well? I, I do have a view on this, but it's not just a personal view. It's uh, also a... Uh, a view that's reflected by um, the at-large advisory committee um, and many, if not uh, most, of the uh, leadership amounts, the, the various regions, uh, noticing that uh, we as groups and individuals who act in the best interests of internet end users, right, that's, that's our role, um, that we are always concerned um, about the nature and the management of the various TLDs, be they G, generic, or CC, country code uh, space. And in the case of a number of um, country codes in particular, um, we, we are constantly reminding people that the engagement as part of a multi-stakeholder model, which we're all card-carrying members of the sport club for, um, you know, the engagement with the significantly interested parties locally is essential. In other words, the local community, and that can include, depending on the nature of the territory or country, um, you know, providing they've got that ISO alpha code, right, um, then it should include all levels of government. It should include business. It should include civil society. It should include the technical community. It could, you should include, you know, small business and the whole kit and caboodle. Um, if you could declare yourself affected and a significantly interested party, then you should have the opportunity, you should have no barrier to being engaged um, in at least having input in an opinion on the management of these spaces. So I can certainly declare that line quite publicly. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Cheryl. And that's that's consistent with RFC 1591, which is one of the totemic founding elements of the policy framework that does apply to CCTLVs. Um, uh, look, um, thank you for the, the questions um, and discussion panelists. I'm just going to take the last 10 minutes to do a little a little quick readout of the of the IGF and the three of you whose videos are still on and I did attend either online or in person the IGF. Um, I'm just going to give you sort of a very brief opportunity to offer any quick reflections about um, about the event. Um, uh, and just to mention that one of the things that happened at the event was the launch of a paper um, by the IGF leadership panel. 
um, uh, which is called The Internet We Want. Um, as Vince Cerf, uh, the chair of the panel, very pithily put it, uh, if we don't set out the internet we want, we'll end up getting the internet we deserve. And so it's a bit of establishment of some, a bit of a vision for how the, the LP, the leadership panel would like to see the internet evolve. You can find that by searching for the internet we want panel IGF leadership. Um, you'll be able to find it that way. Um, uh, I'll take the same order just for any brief reflections and then do a little bit of a wrap up. Um, so Cheryl and then uh, Ian and then Annalise. Uh, Cheryl, any sort of pithy remarks about the Internet Governance Forum 2023? Cheryl is always happy to be pithy with her remarks, uh, but in the case of uh, commentary on the, the uh, Kyoto Internet Governance Forum, um, I need to note that I uh, was a remote participant, not an on-site participant, and so um, one of the things I think I would like to note is over the recent years, um, obviously post-COVID, but continuing on, um, is the marked improvement in the ability for people who are not on site at these very important and major meetings to be involved, um, including um, at one point it was very limited to certain tracks. Now it is, um, you know, there's pretty much, if it's on, you can get to it um, remotely, you know, short of lunch and drinks, you're, you're pretty much covered. And that's a compliment, I think, um, that should be noted. Also noting um, that it is working very much in a multilingual environment. So enormous efforts are made to make sure that um, the wider global community interested in internet governance can have as fewer barriers to engagement as possible. And that also includes um, a very fair um, amount of time spent asking, is there remote participants wanting to participate? Are there questions coming online, et cetera? So compliments there. Uh, criticism, way too much going on. Far too many, often duplicative topics. Uh, it should not be an award of how many things can be stuck together in our fewer days. Um, we really, I think, need to rationalise and look at the quality, not just the quantity. Um, all of it's terrific, but um, a lot of it falls by the wayside um, and doesn't get the notice it should deserve. So there might be some clever thinking involved in my personal perspective anyway. Thanks. Thanks, um, Cheryl. And um, I was uh, pleased and somewhat intimidated to have been appointed to the, the multi-stakeholder advisory group, the MAG, that's been... Um, that does the programming and there's been a lot of riffing on the too many sessions too much duplication so that'll be something i'll take on board for the 2024 event in my one of 50 role there um ian uh pithy reflections um i think for me the the igf in kyoto was a fantastic um event it was absolutely thrilling to see so many people come in in person and and attend, including uh, quite a large number of government representatives here um, on the ground as well. Um, to me, that really underscored the, the the critical role that the IGF plays in ha in being a forum for these internet governance conversations. Um, it, it was um, quite apparent to me that um, uh, a lot of other governments um, are seeing the, the heat increase on these broader global digital conversations and um, and rightly so, should be turning to the IGF as the forum to have these conversations. Um, a lot of a lot of my time was spent um, uh, connecting with with my colleagues on the ground and getting a sense for what might be in store for the for the year ahead. Um, I think the global digital digital compact was uh, brought up a couple of times in quite a number of sessions, um, and so as a as a, as a venue to uh, collaborate, to connect, to coordinate. Um, I, I think it was uh, incredibly timely, incredibly useful uh, to have this in, in Kyoto. Um, I, I probably agree. Um, next year, we should try and look to bring a little bit more focus to the to the agenda. Uh, there was it was it was quite hard to track all of the topics across all of the sessions. Um, and so to me, uh, my thinking um, goes towards, well, what what might be coming out of those global conversations and how might we start to address um, the improvements to, to the IGF 
um, as it's seated within this within this broader broader context um, over the next two years or so. Um, so it was uh, a great a great event. Uh, the fireworks were lovely, and it was just it was a, a wonderful location um, up at the uh, up at the venue. Um, so uh, for me, I think it was a it was a week well well spent uh, talking about some of the big big ticket issues that we'll be looking to grapple with over the next over the next two years. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Um, Annalise, over to you. Thanks, Jordan. Um, not much more to add beyond what uh, Cheryl and, and Ian have said. I think um, it was a, a fantastic event and compared to previous IGFs that I've been to sort of um, in person in the past or, or participated in online, um, it, it was it, it felt very lively this year. Um, there was, uh, you know, they had over 6,000 in-person participants, which was um, huge. But the, the uh, as Ian mentioned, a significant government presence and there was also um, a lot of uh, private sector participants as well. Um, IGFs have in recent years sort of lent quite heavily towards civil society particip participation. So it was good to have... Um, um, you know, have a, have a bit more of stakeholder balance and have some, um, you know, more genuinely multi-stakeholder conversations, I think, with um, uh, a wide range of stakeholders um, participating. But, yeah, um, it's it looked, you know, people are, are leaning in. I think people see it as a, a valuable forum. That's it for me. Thanks, Annalise. Um, and I'll just offer a couple of more observations. Um there was a big focus on AI, but the agenda did really cover the whole gamut of um, what some people call governance of the internet and governance on the internet. This is a this is a digital policy forum as much as it is a, an internet governance forum, and that's good because these issues all influence each other and need to be discussed together. So I don't mind the breadth of topics, but I do mind the the <laughs> multiplicity of repeating uh, sessions, and I think that's something to do some work on. Secondly, um, you know, Ada has been stepping up into a bit of a leadership role in trying to provoke discussion about how to improve and sustain the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. We've mentioned the internet governance roadmap that we published in August, and we were able to assemble a group of interesting um, people from other domain registries, from, from governments, uh, from civil society, um, to discuss the roadmap and what to follow up on it on two occasions. We used some of the bilateral meeting rooms at the Kyoto International Convention Center to do that. Um, and we were really struck by the warmth of the response from um, participants um, and the sort of expectation that that had created about having staked out a bit of a leadership role. People are expecting us to follow through on that and, and do what we can to actually see through the vision that that roadmap sketches out. Um, and part of that is taking a role um, in trying to shape the global digital compact. And Ada will have more to say about that um, as the year ends and moving into 2024, working closely with Australian government, other CCTLD registries um, and other players to, to help shape that in a way that's supportive of internet governance. Um, and then uh, the other aspect that came out um, was ongoing discussion from uh, various parties about whether a, a Net Mundial plus 10 event um, around about 10 years after the first of those was hosted in Brazil in 2014, so next year, would be a useful point uh, to have a multi-stakeholder conversation about the future of internet governance as we run into the Global Digital Compact and then the WSIS plus 20 review. Um, so working on behalf of all of you in the Australian internet community, we're prosecuting that work, I would always love to discuss it with you if you're interested. Um, and that's that's my reflection on the IGF. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for your participation. We've had around 40, 45 people on the webinar today. Um, thank you so much for your interest uh, as a, as a uh, watcher and um, questioner. Um, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed the perspectives shared by our wonderful panelists. Um, my thanks to Julie and to Cheryl and to Ian and to Annalise for the um, insights and perspectives you've offered uh, with the group today. Um, as usual, this will be published on the ADA website um, so that you can go back to the video or publish uh, or point other people towards it if you'd like to. Um, and I think with that, uh, we can sign off for this one. Um, and we'll be back with you in March 2024 for a readout on the next ICANN meeting, ICANN 79 
which will be coming to us all from uh, San Juan in Puerto Rico. Uh, but for now, um, have a lovely day and uh, we'll bring the webinar to an end.